Dramatis Personae of the Knight of the Burning Pestle by Francis Beaumont and John Fletcher. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dramatis Personae. Citizen, read by Phil Burst. Wife, read by Joe Vickers. Rafe, read by Rob Board. Venture Well. Read by John Berlinson. Mary Thought. Read by Todd. Mistress Mary Thought. Read by Sonia. Jasper. Read by David Prickett. Humphrey. Read by Brad Philippone. Luce. Read by Charlotte Duckett. Michael. Read by Rob Board. A Boy. Read by Scarlet G. Pomponia. Read by Newgate Novelist. Tim. Read by Dylan McFarlane. George, read by Michelle Eaton. Speaker of the Prologue. Read by Alan Mapstone. Man, Second Man, and Third Man, read by Tom Davis Beale. Woman, read by Marianne. William Hammerton. Read by Alan Mapstone. Barber, read by Joseph Tabler. Tapster. Read by Lian Yao. Host. Read by Anna Simon. Servant. Read by Georgina Shaw. First Soldier. Read by Marianne. Second Soldier. Read by Lian Yao. George Greengoose. Read by David Purdy. Sergeant. Read by Joseph Tabler. Narrated by Christine G. End of Dramatis Personae. Act One of The Night of the Burning Pestle by Francis Beaumont and John Fletcher. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. To the readers of this comedy, gentlemen, the world is so nice in these our times that for apparel there is no fashion. For music, which is a rare art thou now slighted, no instrument. For diet, none but the French kickshaws that are delicate, and for place, no invention but that which now runneth an invective away, touching some particular persons, or else it is contemned before it is thoroughly understood. This is all that I have to say, that the author had no intent to wrong any one in this comedy, but, as a merry passage, here and there interlaced it with delight, which he hopes will please all, and be hurtful to none. Prologue. Where the bee can suck no honey, she leaves her sting behind, and where the bear cannot find origanum to heal his grief, he blasteth all other leaves with his breath. We fare it is like to fare so with us, that, seeing you cannot draw from our labours sweet content, you leave behind you a sore mislike, and with open reproach blame our good meaning, because you cannot reap the wanted mirth. Our intent was at this time, to move inward delight, not outward lightness, and to breed, if it might be, soft smiling, not loud laughing, knowing it, to be wise, to be a great pleasure to hear counsel mixed with wit, as to the foolish, to have sport mingled with rudeness. They were banished to theatre at Athens, and from Rome hissed, that brought parasites on the stage with apish actions, or fools with uncivil habits, or courtesans with immodest words. We have endeavoured to be as far from unseemingly speeches, to make your ears glow, as you hope you will be free from unkind reports, or mistaking the author's intention, who never aimed at any one particular in this play, to make our cheeks blush. And thus I leave it, and thee to thine own censure, to like or dislike. Veil vale. Scene London and the neighbouring country, excepting Act Four, Scene Two, where it is in Moldavia, the night of the burning pestle. Induction. Several gentlemen sitting on stools upon the stage. The citizen, his wife, and Rafe sitting below among the audience. Enter speaker of the prologue. From all that's near the court, from all that's great, within the compass of the city walls, we now have brought our scene. 
Citizen leaps on the stage. Hold your peace, Goodman boy. What do you mean, sir? That you have no good meaning. This seven years there hath been plays at this house. I have observed it. You have still girds at Citizen's. And now you call your play The London Merchant? Down with your title, boy. Down with your title. Are you a member of the noble city? I am. And a freeman? Yeah, and a grocer. So, grocer, then, by your sweet favour, we intend no abuse to the city. No, sir. Yes, sir. And if you are not resolved to play the jacks, what need you study for new subjects, purposely to abuse your betters? Why could you not be contented, as well as others, with the legend of Whittingham, or the life and death of Sir Thomas Gresham, with the buildings of the Royal Exchange, or the story of Queen Eleanor, with the rearing of London Bridge upon Woolsax? You seem to be an understanding man. What would you have us do, sir? Why, present something notably in honour of the commons of the city. Why, what do you say to the life and death of Fat Drake, or the repairing of the fleet privies? I do not like that, but I will have a citizen, and he shall be of my own trade. Oh, you should have told us your mind a month since. Our play is ready to begin now. Tis all one for that. I will have a grocer, and he shall do admirable things. What will you have him do? Mary, I will have him... Husband! Husband! Peace, mistress. Hold thy peace, Rafe. I know what I do, I warrant ye. Husband! Husband! What sayest thou, Coney? Let him kill a lion with a pestle, husband. Let him kill a lion with a pestle. So he shall. I'll have him kill a lion with a pestle. Husband! Shall I come up, husband? Aye, Coney. Rafe, help your mistress this way. Pray, gentlemen, make her a little room. I pray you, sir, lend me your hand to help up my wife. I thank you, sir. So, wife comes on the stage. By your leave, gentlemen all. I'm something troublesome. I'm a stranger here. I was ne'er at one of these plays, as I say before, but I should have seen Jane Shaw once, and my husband hath promised me any time this twelve month to carry me to the bold Beauchamp. But in truth he did not. I pray you bear with me. Boy, let my wife and I have a couple of stools, and then begin, and let the grocer do rare things. Stools are brought. But sir, we have never a boy to play him. Every one hath a part already. Husband, husband, for God's sake, let Rafe play him. Beshrew me if I do not think he will go beyond them all. Well remembered, wife. Come up, Rafe. I'll tell you, gentlemen. Let them but lend him a suit of apparel and necessaries. And by gad, if any of them all blow wind in the tail on him, I'll be hanged. Rafe comes on the stage. I pray you, youth, let him have a suit of apparel. I'll be sworn, gentlemen, my husband tells you true. He will act you sometimes at our house, that all the neighbours cry out on him. He will fetch you up a couraging part in the garret that we are all as feared. I warrant you that we quake again. We'll fear our children with him. If they never be so unruly, do but cry, Rafe comes, Rafe comes, to them, and they'll be as quiet as lambs. Hold up thy head, Rafe. Show the gentleman what thou can do. Speak a huffing part. I warrant you the gentleman will accept of it. Do, Rafe, do. By heaven, methinks it were an easy leap to pluck bright honour from the pale-faced moon, or dive into the bottom of the sea, where never fathom line touched any ground and pluck up drowned honour from the lake of hell. How say you, gentlemen? Is it not as I told you? Nay, gentlemen, he hath played before, my husband says, Musidorus before the wardens of our company. Aye, and he should have played Geronimo with a shoemaker for a wager. He shall have a suit of apparel, if he will go in. In, Rafe, in, Rafe, and set out the grocery in their kind, if thou lovest me. Exit, Rafe. I warrant our Rafe will look finely when he's dressed. But what will you have it called? The Grocer's Honour. Methinks the Knights of the Burning Pestle were better. I'll be sworn, husband. That's as good a name as can be. Let it be so. Begin, begin. My wife and I will sit down. I pray you do. 
What stately music have you? You have shawms? Shawms, no. No? I'm a thief, if my mind did not give me so. Rafe plays a stately part, and he must needs have shawms. I'll be at the charge of them myself, rather than we'll be without them. So you are like to be. Why, and so I will be. There's two shillings. Give us money. Let's have the weights of Southwick. They are as rare fellows as any are in England, and that will fetch them all over the water with a vengeance, as if they were mad. You shall have them. Will you sit down then? All right, come, wife. Sit you merry all, gentlemen. I'm bold to sit among you for my ease. Citizen and wife, sit down. From all that's near the court, from all that's great, within the compass of the city walls, we now have brought our scene. Fly far from hence all private taxes, immodest phrases, whatever may but show like vicious. For wicked mirth never true pleasure brings, but honest minds are pleased with honest things. Thus much for that we do, but for Rafe's part, you must answer for yourself. Take you no care for Rafe. He'll discharge himself, I warrant you. Exit speaker of prologue. I faith, gentlemen, I'll give my word for Rafe. Act first, scene one. A room in the house of Venturewell. Enter Venturewell and Jasper. Sirrah, I'll make you know you are my prentice, and whom my charitable love redeemed even from the fall of fortune. Gave thee heat and growth to be what thou now art. New cast thee, adding the trust of all I have at home in foreign staples, or upon the sea to thy direction. Tide the good opinions both of myself and friends to thy endeavours. So fair were thy beginnings. But with these, as I remember, you had never charged to love your master's daughter, and even then when I had found a wealthy husband for her. I take it, sir, you had not. But, however, I'll break the neck of that commission and make you know you are but a merchant's factor. Sir, I do liberally confess I am yours, both bound by love and duty to your service, in which my labour hath been all my profit. I have not lost in bargain, nor delighted to wear your honest gains upon my back. Nor have I given a pension to my blood, or lavishly in play consumed your stock. These, and the miseries that do attend them, I dare with innocence proclaim as strangers to all my temperate actions. For your daughter, if there be any love to my deservings, born by her virtuous self, I cannot stop it, nor am I able to refrain her wishes. She's private to herself, and best of knowledge, whom she'll make so happy as to sigh for. Besides, I cannot think you mean to match her unto a fellow of so lame a presence, one that hath little left of nature in him. Tis very well, sir. I can tell your wisdom how all this shall be cured. Your care becomes you. And thus it shall be, sir. I here discharge you my house and service. Take your liberty. And when I want a son, I'll send for you. Exit. These be the fair rewards of them that love? Oh, you that live in freedom, never prove the travail of a mind led by desire. Enter loose. Why, how now, friend? Struck with my father's thunder. Struck and struck dead unless the remedy be full of speed and virtue. I am now what I expected long. No more your father's. But mine. But yours, and only yours I am. That's all I have to keep me from the statute. You dare be constant still. Oh, fear me not. In this I dare to be better than a woman. Nor shall his anger, nor his offers move me. Were they both equal to a prince's power? You know my rival. Yes, and love him dearly. Even as I love an ague or foul weather. I prithee, Jasper, fear him not. Oh, no. I do not mean to do him so much kindness. 
but to our own desires. You know the plot we both agreed on. Yes, and will perform my part exactly. I desire no more. Farewell, and keep my heart. Tis yours. I take it. He must do miracles to make me forsake it. Exant severally. Fie upon them, little infidels. What's the matter here now? Well, I'll be hanged for half a penny if there's not some abomination knavery in this play. Well, let them look to it. Rafe must come. And if there be any tricks a brewing... Let him brew and bake too, husband, at God's name. Rafe will find all out. I warrant you, and they were older than they are. Enter, boy. I pray my pretty youth is Rafe ready? He will be presently. Now, I pray you, make my commendations unto him, and withal carry him this stick of licorice. Tell him his mistress sent it to him, and bid him bite a piece. Twill open his pipes the better, say. Exit, boy. Scene two. Another room in the house of Venture Well. Enter Venture Well and Humphrey. Come, sir, she's yours. Upon my faith she's yours. You have my hand. For other idle lets between your hopes and her. Thus with a wind they are scattered and no more. My wanton prentice, that like a bladder blew himself with love, I have let out and sent him to discover new masters, yet unknown. I thank you, sir, indeed I thank you, sir, and ere I stir it shall be known, however you do deem, I am of gentle blood and gentle seam. Oh, sir, I know it certain. Sir, my friend, although, as writers say, all things have end, and that we call a pudding hath his too, Oh, let it not seem strange, I pray to you, if in this bloody simile I put my love more endless than frail things or gut. Husband, I prithee, sweet lamb, tell me one thing, but tell me truly. Stay, youth, I beseech you, till I question my husband. What is it, Mouse? Sirrah, didst thou ever see a prettier child? How it behaves itself, I warrant ye, and speaks and looks, and perts up the head? I pray you, brother, with your favour, will you never none of Master Monkester's scholars? Chicken, I prithee heartily, contain thyself. The children are pretty children, but when Rafe comes, lamb... Aye, when Rafe comes, Coney. Well, my youth, you may proceed. Well, sir, you know my love, and rest, I hope, assured of my consent. Get but my daughters, and wed her when you please. You must be bold, and clap in close unto her. Come, I know you have language good enough to win a wench. A horse and tyrant! He has been an old stringer in his days, I warrant him. I take your gentle offer, and withal yield love again for love reciprocal. What, Luce? Within there? Enter Luce. Called you, sir? I did. Give entertainment to this gentleman, and see you be not froward. To her, sir, my presence will but be an eyesore to you. Exit. Fair mistress Luce, how do you? Are you well? Give me your hand, and then I pray you tell how doth your little sister and your brother, and whether you love me or any other. Sir, these are quickly answered. So they are, where women are not cruel. But how far is it now distant from this place we are in, unto that blessed place, your father's warren? What makes you think that, sir? Even that face, for stealing rabbits, Willem, in that place, God, Cupid, or the keeper, I know not whether, unto my cost and charges brought you thither, and there began— Your game, sir. Let no game, or any thing that tendeth to the same, be evermore remembered, thou fair killer, for whom I sate me down and break my tiller. There's a kind gentleman, I warrant you. When will you do as much for me, George? Beshrew me, sir. I am sorry for your losses. But as the proverb says, I cannot cry. I would you have not seen me. So would I, unless you had more ma to do me good. Why cannot this strange passion be withstood? Send for a constable, and raise the town. Oh, no! My valiant love will batter down millions of constables, and put to flight even that great watch of midsummer day at night. Beshrew me, sir. T'were good I yielded, then. Weak women cannot hope, where valiant men have no resistance. Yield, then, 
I am full of pity, though I say it, and can pull out of my pocket thus a pair of gloves. Look, Luce, look. The dog's tooth, nor the doves, are not so white as these, and sweet they be, and whipped about with silk, as you may see. If you desire the price, shoot from your eye a beam to this place, and you shall espy they cost me three and tuppence, or no money. Well, sir, I take them kindly, and I thank you. What would you more? Nothing. Why, then, farewell. Nor so, nor so. For, lady, I must tell before we part, for what we met together, God grant me time and patience, and fair weather. Speak, and declare your mind in terms so brief. I shall. Then, first and foremost, for relief I call to you, if that you can afford it. I care not at what price, for on my word it shall be repaid again, although it cost me more than I'll speak of now. For love hath tossed me in fury's blanket like a tennis-ball, and now I rise aloft, and now I fall. Alas, good gentleman, alas the day! I thank you heartily, and as I say, thus do I still continue without rest in the morning like a man, at night a beast, roaring and bellowing mine own disquiet, that much I fear, forsaking of my diet will bring me presently to that quandary I shall bid all adieu. Now, by St. Mary, that were a great pity. So it were, beshrew me. Then ease me, lusty loose, and pity show me. Why, sir, you will know my will is worth nothing without my father's grant. Get his consent, and then you may with assurance try me. The worshipful your sire will not deny me, for I have asked him, and he hath replied, Sweet Master Humphrey, loose shall be thy bride. Sweet Master Humphrey, then I am content. And so am I, in truth. Yet take me with you, there is another clause must be annexed. And this is it. I swore, and will perform it. No man shall ever join me as his wife, but he that stole me hence. If you dare venture, I am yours. You need not fear, my father loves you. If not, farewell for ever. Stay, nymph, stay. I have a double gelding, coloured bay, sprung by his father from barbarian kind, another for myself, though somewhat blind, yet true as trusty tree. I am satisfied, and so will give my hand. Our course must lie through Walton Forest, where I have a friend will entertain us. So, farewell, Sir Humphrey, and think about your business. Exit. Though I die, I am resolved to venture life and limb, for one so young, so fair, so kind, so trim. Exit. By my faith and trust, George, and as I am virtuous, it is e'en the kindest young man who ever trod on shoe leather. Well, go thy ways. If thou hast her not, it is not thy fault, if faith. I prithee, mouse, be patient. He shall ever, or I'll make some of them smoke for it. That's my good lamb, George. Why, this stinking tobacco kills me. Would there were none in England. Now, I pray, gentlemen, what good does this stinking tobacco do you? Nothing, I warrant you. Make chimneys of your faces. Scene three. A grocer's shop. Enter Rafe as a grocer, reading Palmarine of England. With Tim and George. Oh, husband, husband, now, now, there's Rafe, there's Rafe. Peace, fool. Let Rafe alone. Hark you, Rafe. Do not strain yourself too much at the first. Peace. Begin, Rafe. Rafe reads. Then Palmerin and Trinaeus, snarching their lances from their dwarfs and clasping their helmets, galloped amain after the giant, and Palmerin, having gotten a sight of him, came posting amain, saying, Stay, traitorous thief. For thou mayst not so carry away her that is worth the greatest lord in the world. And with these words gave him a blow on a shoulder, that he struck him besides his elephant. And Trinaeus, coming to the knight that had Agricola behind him, set him soon besides his horse, with his neck broken in a fall, so that the princess, getting out of the throng, between joy and grief, said, Oh, happy knight! The mirror of all such as follow arms, now may I be well assured of the laugh thou bearest me. I wonder why the knights do not raise an army of fourteen or fifteen hundred thousand men, 
as big as the army that the Prince of Portigo brought against Rossi Clare, and destroy these giants. They do much hurt to wandering damsels that go in quest of their knights. Faith, husband, and Rafe says true, for they say the King of Portugal cannot sit at his meat, but the giants and the Ettins will come and snatch it from him. Hold thy tongue! On, Rafe! And certainly those knights are much to be commended, who, neglecting their possessions, wander with a squire and a dwarf through the deserts to relieve poor ladies. Aye, by my faith are they, Rafe. Let them say what they will, they are indeed. Our knights neglect their possessions well enough, but they do not the rest. There are no such courteous and fair well-spoken knights in this age. They will call one the son of an oar, that Palmerin of England would have called Fair Sir, and one that Rosser Clare would have called Right Beauteous Damsel, they will call Damned Bitch. I'll be sworn, will they, Rafe? They have called me so an hundred times about a scurvy pipe of tobacco. But what brave spirit could be content to sit in his shop with a flap it of wood and a blue apron before him selling Mithridatum and dragon's water to visited houses that might pursue feats of arms and through his noble achievements procure such a famous history to be written of his heroic prowess? Well said, Rafe. Some more of those words, Rafe. They go finally by my troth. Why should not I, then, pursue this course, both for the credit of myself and our company? For amongst all the worthy books of achievements, I do not call to mind that I yet read of a grosser errant. I will be the said knight. Have you heard of any that hath wandered unfurnished of his squire and dwarf? My elder apprentice Tim shall be my trusty squire, and little George, my dwarf, hence my blue apron. Yet, in remembrance of my former trade, upon my shield shall be portrayed a burning pestle, and I will be called the Knight of the Burning Pestle. Nay, I dare swear thou wilt not forget thy old trade. Thou were ever meek. Tim. Anon. My beloved squire, and George, my dwarf. I charge you that from henceforth you never call me by any other name but the right courteous and valiant Knight of the Burning Pestle, and that you never call any female by the name of a woman or wench, but fair lady, if she have her desires, if not, distressed damsel, that you call all forests and heaths deserts, and all horses palfreys. This is very fine, Faith. Do the gentlemen like Rafe, think you, husbands? Aye, I warrant thee. The players would give all the shoes in their shop for him. My beloved squire Tim, stand out. Admit this were a desert, and over it a knight errant pricking, and I should bid you inquire of his intents. What would you say? Sir, my master sent me to know whether you are riding. No, thus, fair sir. The right courteous and valiant knight of the burning pestle commanded me to inquire upon what adventure you are bound, whether to relieve some distressed damsel or otherwise. Forsome blockhead, cannot remember. If faith, and Rafe told him on before. All the gentlemen heard him. Did he not, gentlemen? Did not Rafe tell him on? Right courteous and valiant knight of the burning pestle. Here is a distressed damsel to have a half penny worth of pepper. That's a good boy. See, the little boy can hit it. By my troth, it's a fine child. Relieve her with all courteous language. Now, shut up shop. No more my prentice, but my trusty squire and dwarf. I must bespeak my shield and arming pestle. Exant Tim and George. Go thy ways, Rafe. As I'm a true man, thou art the best on them all. Rafe! Rafe! What say you, mistress? I prithee, come again quickly, sweet Rafe. <laughs> by and by. Exit. Scene four. A room in a Merrythought's house. Enter Mistress Merrythought and Jasper. Give thee my blessing. No, I'll never give thee my blessing. I'll see thee hanged first. It shall never be said I gave thee my blessing. 
thou art thy father's own son of the right blood of the merry thoughts i may curse the time that ever i knew thy father he has spent all his own and mine too and when i tell him of it he laughs and dances and sings and cries a merry heart lives longer and thou art the waste thrift and art run away from thy master that loved thee well and art come to me and i have laid up a little for my younger son michael and thou thinkest to bezel that but thou shalt never be able to do it come hither michael enter michael come michael down on thy knees thou shalt have my blessing michael Niels. I pray you, mother, pray to God to bless me. God bless thee, but Jasper shall never have my blessing. He shall be hanged first, shall he not, Michael? How sayest thou? Yes, forsooth, mother, and grace of God. That's a good boy. If I, it's a fine spoken child. Mother, though you forget a parent's love, I must preserve the duty of a child. I ran not for my master, nor returned to have your stock maintain my idleness. Ungracious child, I warrant him. Hark how he chops logic with his mother. Thou hast best tell her she lies. Do tell her she lies. If he were my son, I would hang him up by the heels and flay him and salt him, wholesome halter sack. My coming only is to beg your love, which I must ever, though I never gain it. And howsoever you esteem of me, there is no drop of blood hid in these veins, but I remember well. Belongs to you that brought me forth, and will be glad for you to rip them all again, and let it all out. E faith, I had sorrow enough for thee, God knows, but I'll hamper thee well enough. Get thee in, thou vagabond, get thee in, and learn of thy brother Michael. Exant Jasper and Michael Mary thought, singing within. Nose, nose. Jolly red nose, and who gave thee this jolly red nose? Hark, my husband. He's singing and hoiting, and I'm fain to cark and care and all little enough. Husband? Charles? Charles Merrythought. Enter Merrythought. Nutmegs and ginger, cinnamon and cloves, and they gave me this jolly red nose. If you would consider your state, you would have little list to sing, Iwis. It should never be considered while it were in a state, if I thought it would spoil my singing. But how wilt thou do, Charles? Thou art an old man, and thou canst not work, and thou hast not forty shillings left, and thou eatest good meat, and drinkest good drink, and laughest. And will do. But how wilt thou come by it, Charles? How? Why, how have I done hitherto these forty years? I never came into my dining-room, but, at eleven and six o'clock, I found excellent meat and drink of the table. My clothes were never worn out, but next morning a tailor brought me a new suit. And without question, it will be so ever. Use makes perfectness. If all should fail, it is but a little straining myself extraordinary, and laugh myself to death. It's a foolish old man, this. Is he not, George? Yes, Coney. Give me a penny in the purse while I live, George. Ay, by lady, Coney, hold thee there. Well, Charles, you promised to provide for Jasper, and I have laid up for Michael. I pray you, pay Jasper his portion. He's come home, and he shall not consume Michael's stock. He says his master turned him away, but I promise you truly, I think he ran away. Now indeed, Mistress Mary thought, though he be a notable gallows, yet I'll assure you his master did turn him away, even in this place. Twas a faith... Within this half hour, about his daughter, my husband was by. Hang him, rogue. He served him well enough. Love his master's daughter. By my troth, Coney, if there were a thousand boys, thou would spoil them all with taking their parts. Let his mother alone with him. Ay, George, but yet truth is truth. Where is Jasper? He's welcome, however. Call him in. He shall have his portion. Is he merry? Ah, foul chai of him. He's too merry. Jasper, Michael, re-enter Jasper and Michael. Welcome, Jasper. Though thou runnest away, welcome. God bless thee. Tis thy mother's mind thou shouldst receive thy portion. Thou hast been abroad, and I hope hast learned experience enough to govern it. Thou art of sufficient years. Hold thy hand. One, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There is ten shillings for thee. Thrust thyself into the world with that, and take some settled course. If fortune cross thee, thou hast a retiring place. Come home to me. I have twenty shillings left. Be a good husband, that is, wear ordinary clothes, eat the best meat, and drink the best drink. Be merry, and give to the poor. And believe me, thou hast no end of thy goods. Long may you live free from all thought of ill, and long have cause to be thus merry still. But father... No more words, Jasper. Get thee gone. Thou hast my blessing, thy father's spirit upon thee. Farewell, Jasper. But yet, or ere you part, O oh, cruel, kiss me, kiss me, sweeting mine, our dear jewel. So now be gone, no words. Exit, Jasper. So, Michael, now get ye gone too. Yes, forsooth, mother, but I'll have my father's blessing first. No, Michael, tis no matter for his blessing. Thou hast my blessing. Be gone. I'll fetch my money and jewels and follow thee. I'll stay no longer with him, I warrant thee. Exit, Michael. Truly, Charles, I'll be gone too. What? You will not? Yes, indeed, I will. Hey, 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 ho, 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 farewell, Nan. I'll never trust Wench more again if I can. You shall not think when all your own is gone to spend that I have been scraping up for Michael. Farewell, good wife. I expect it not. All I have to do in this world is to be merry, which I shall, if the grounds be not taken from me. And if it be, when earth and seas from me are reft, the skies aloft for me are left. Exeunt severally. I'll be sworn, he's a merry old gentleman for all that. Hark! Hark, husband, hark! Fiddles! Fiddles! Now surely they go finely. They say tis present death for these fiddlers to tune their rebeck before the great Turk's grace. It's not, George. Enter a boy and dances. But look, look, here's a youth dances. Now, good youth, do a turn on the toe. Sweet art of faith, I'll have Rafe come and do some of his gambles. He'll ride the wild mare, gentlemen, for do your arts good to see him. I thank you, kind youth. Pray, bid Rafe come. Peace, Coney. Sirrah, you scurvy boy. Bid the players send Rafe, or by God's... Uh, and they do not. I'll turn them some of their periwigs beside their heads. This is all riff-raff. Exit, boy. End of Act One. Act Two of The Night of the Burning Pestle by Francis Beaumont and John Fletcher. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Second, Scene One. A Room in the House of Venture Well. Enter Venture Well and Humphrey. And how, Faith? How goes it now, son Humphrey? Right worshipful and my beloved friend and father dear, this matter's at an end. Tis well. It should be so. I'm glad the girl is found so tractable. Nay, she must whirl from hence, and you must wink, for so I say the story tells, to-morrow before day. George, dost thou think in thy conscience now it will be a match? Tell me but what thou thinkest, sweet rogue. Thou seest the poor gentleman, dear art, how it labours and throbs, I warrant you to be at rest. I'll go move the father for it. No, no. I prithee. Sit still, honeysuckle. Thou spoil all. If he deny him, and I'll bring half a dozen good fellows myself, and in the shutting of an evening, knocked up, and there's an end. I'll bust thee for that, if faith, boy. Well, George, well, you have been a wag in your days, I warrant you, but God forgive you, and I do, with all my heart. How was it, son? 
you told me that to-morrow before daybreak you must convey her hence i must i must and thus it is agreed your daughter rides upon a brown bay steed i on a sorrel which i bought of brian the honest host of the red roaring lion in waltham situate then if you may consent in seemly sort lest by delay the fatal sisters come and do the office and then you'll sing another song alas why should you be thus full of grief to me that do as willing as yourself agree to anything so be it good and fair then steal her when you will if such a pleasure content you both i'll sleep and never see it to make your joys more full but tell me why you may not here perform your marriage god's blessing of the soul old man if faith thou art loath to part true hearts i see he has a judge and i'm as glad on well go thy ways humphrey for a fair-spoken man i believe thou hast not thy fellow within the walls of london and i should say the suburbs too i should not lie why dost not rejoice with me george if i could but see rafe again i were as merry as mine host if faith the cause you seem to ask i thus declare help me o oh muses nine your daughter swear a foolish oath and more it was the pity yet no one but myself within this city shall dare to say so but a bold defiance shall meet him were he of the noble science and yet she swear and yet why did she swear truly i cannot tell unless it were for her own ease for sure sometimes an oath being sworn thereafter is like cordial broth and this it was she swore never to marry but such a one whose mighty arm could carry as meaning me for i am such a one her bodily away through stick and stone till both of us arrive at her request some ten miles off in the wild waltham forest if this be all you shall not need to fear any denial in your love proceed i'll neither follow nor repent the deed Good night, twenty good nights, and twenty more, and twenty more good nights. That makes three score. Exeunt severally. Scene two. Waltham Forest. Enter Mistress Marythought and Michael. Come, Michael. Art thou not weary, boy? No, forsooth, mother, not I. Where we be now, child? Indeed, forsooth, mother. I cannot tell unless we be at mile end is not all the world mile end mother no michael not all the world boy but i can assure thee michael mile end is a goodly matter there has been a pitch field my child between the naughty spaniels and the englishmen and the spaniels ran away michael and the englishmen followed my neighbour coxstone was there boy and killed them all with a birding piece mother of forsooth what says my white boy shall not my father go with us too no michael let thy father go sneak up he shall never come between a pair of sheets with me again while he lives let him stay at home and sing for his supper boy come child sit down and i'll show my boy fine necks indeed they sit down and she takes out a casket look here michael here's a ring and here's a brooch and here's a bracelet and here's two rings more and here's money and gold by the eye my boy shall i have all this mother ay michael thou shalt have all michael how likest thou this wench i cannot tell i would have rafe george i'll see no more else indeed la and i pray you let the youth understand so much by word of mouth for i tell you truly i'm afraid of my boy come come george let's be merry and wise the child's a fatherless child and say they should put him into a straight pair of gaskins to a worse than not grass he would never grow after it enter rafe tim and george here's rafe here's rafe how do you do rafe you are welcome rafe as i may say he's a good boy hold up thy head and be not afraid we are thy friends rafe the gentleman will praise thee rafe if thou playest thy part with audacity begin rafe a god's name my trusty squire unlace my helm give me my hat where are we or what desert might this be mirror of knighthood this is as i take it the perilous waltham down in whose bottom stands the enchanted valley 
Oh, Michael, we are betrayed, we are betrayed. Here be giants. Fly, boy, fly, boy, fly. Exit with Michael, leaving the casket. Lace on my helm again. What noise is this? A gentle lady fly in the embrace of some uncourteous knight? I will relieve her. Go, squire, and say the knight that wears this pestle in honour of all ladies swears revenge upon that recreant coward that pursues her. Go comfort her, and that same gentle squire that bears her company. I go, brave knight. Exit. My trusty dwarf and friend, reach me my shield, and hold it while I swear, first by my knighthood, then by the soul of a maddest de Gaulle, my famous ancestor, then by my sword, the beauteous Brianella, girt about me, by this bright burning pestle of mine honour, the living trophy, and by all respect due to distressed damsels, here I vow never to end the quest of this fair lady, and that forsaken squire, till by my valour I gain their liberty. Heaven bless the knight that thus relieves poor errant gentlewomen. Exaunt. Ay, marry, Rafe, this has some savour in. I would see the proudest of them all offer to carry his box after him. But, George, I will not have him go away so soon. I shall be sick if he go away. That I shall. Call Rafe again, George, call Rafe again. My pretty sweetheart, let him come fight before me, and let's have some drums and some trumpets, and let him kill all that comes near him, and now loves me, George. Peace, a little bird. He shall kill them all, and there were twenty more on them than there are. Enter Jasper. Now, Fortune, if thou beest not only ill, show me thy better face, and bring about thy desperate will, that I may climb at length and stand. This is our place of meeting. If love have any constancy... Oh, age, where any wealthy men are counted happy. How shall I please thee? How deserve thy smiles when I am only rich in misery? My father's blessing in this little coin is my inheritance a strong revenue. From earth thou art, and to the earth I give thee. Throws away the money. There grow and multiply, whilst fresher air breeds me a fresher fortune. Our illusion. Seized the casket. What hath the devil coined himself before me? Tis metal good, it rings well. I am waking and taking too, I hope. Now God's dear blessing upon his heart that left it here. Tis mine. These pearls, I take it, were not left for swine. Exit with a casket. I do not like that this unthrifty you should embezzle away the money. The poor gentlewoman, his mother, will have a heavy heart for it, God knows. And reason good, sweetheart. But let him go. I'll tell Rafe a tale in his ear. She'll fetch him again with a wanion. I warrant him, if he be above ground. And besides, George, here are a number of sufficient gentlemen can witness. And myself, and yourself, and the musicians, if we be called in question. Scene three. Another part of the forest. And to Rafe and George. But here comes Rafe, George. Thou shall hear him speak as he were an emperor. Comes not Sir Squire again? Right, courteous knight, your squire doth come, and with him comes the lady. For and the squire of damsels, as I take it. Enter Tim, Mistress Merrythought, and Michael. Madam, if any service or devour of a poor errant knight may right your wrongs, command it. I am pressed to give you succour. For to that holy end I bear my armour. Alas, sir, I am a poor gentlewoman, and I have lost my money in this forest. <sighs> Desert, you would say, lady, and not lost while I have sword and lance. Dry up your tears, which ill befits the beauty of that face, and tell the story, if I may request it, of your disastrous fortune. Ow, oh, the lass, I left a thousand pounds. A thousand pound, even all the money I had laid up for this youth, upon the side of your mastership. You looked so grim and, as I may say it, saving your presence, more like a giant than a mortal man. I am as you are, lady. So are they all, mortal. But why weeps this gentle squire? Has he not cause to weep, do you think, when he has lost his inheritance? Young Ope of Valor, weep not. 
i am here that will confound thy foe and pay it dear upon his coward head that dares deny distressed squires and ladies equity i have but one horse on which shall ride this lady fair behind me and before this courteous squire fortune will give us more upon our next adventure fairly speed beside us squire and dwarf to do us need Exeunt. did not i tell you now what your men would do by the faith of my body wench for clean action and good delivery they may all cast their caps at him and so they may if faith for i dare speak it boldly the twelve companies of london could not match him timber for timber well george and he be not inveigled by some of these poultry players i have much marvel but george we had done our parts if the boy have any grace to be thankful yes i warrant thee duckling scene four another part of the forest enter humphrey and luce good mistress luce however i in fault am for your lame horse you're welcome unto waltham but which way now to go or what to say i know not truly till it be broad day oh fear not master humphrey i am guide for this place enough then up and ride or if it please you walk for your repose or sit or if you will go pluck a rose either of which shall be indifferent to your good friend and humphrey whose consent is so entangled ever to your will as the poor harmless horse is to the mill faith and you say the word we'll even sit down and take a nap tis better in the town where we may nap together for believe me to sleep without a snatch would mickle grieve me you're merry master humphrey so i am and have been ever merry from my dam your nurse had the less labour faith it may be unless it were by chance i did bewray me enter jasper loose dear friend loose here jasper you are mine if it be so my friend you use me fine what do you think i am an errant noddy a word of obloquy now by god's body i'll tell thy master for i know thee well nay and you be so forward for to tell take that and that and tell him sir i gave it and say i paid you well beats him oh sir i have it and do confess the payment pray be quiet go get to your nightcap and the diet to cure your beaten bones alas poor humphrey get thee some wholesome broth with sage and comfrey a little oil of roses and a feather to anoint thy back with all when I came hither, would I had gone to Paris with John Dory. Farewell, my pretty nump. I am very sorry. I cannot bear thee company. Farewell. The devil's dam was ne'er so banged in hell. Exeunt Luce and Jasper. This young Jasper will prove me another thing of my conscience, and he may be suffered. George, dost not see, George, how he swaggers and flies at the very heads of folks as he were a dragon? Well, if I do not do his lesson for wronging the poor gentleman, I am no true woman. His friends that brought him up might have been better occupied and wished that have taught him these vagaries. He's e'en in the highway to the gallows, God bless him. You're too bitter, Coney. The young man may do well enough for all this. Come hither, Master Humphrey. Has he hurt you? Now beshrew his fingers for it. Here, sweetheart, here's some green ginger for thee. Now beshrew my heart, but he has a pepinal in his head as big as a pullet's egg. Alas, sweet lamb, how thy temples beat. Take the peace on him, sweetheart, take the peace on him. No, no, you talk like a foolish woman. I'll have Ray fight with him and swinge him up well favouredly. Sirrah boy, come hither. Enter boy. Let Rafe come in and fight with Jasper. Aye, and beat him well, he's an unhappy boy. Sir, you must pardon. The pot of our play lies contrary and will hazard the spoiling of our play. Plot me no plots. I'll have Rafe come out. I'll make your home too hot for you else. Why, sir, he shall. But if anything fall out of order, the gentleman must pardon us. Go your ways, goodman boy. Exit, boy. I'll hold him a penny. He shall have his belly full of fighting now. Ho, oh, here comes Rafe. No more. Scene five. Another part of the forest. Enter Rave, Mistress Merrythought, Michael, Tim, and George. What night is that, squire? Ask him if he keep the passage bound by love of Lady Fair, or else but prickin'. Sir, 
I am no knight, but a poor gentleman that this same night had stolen from me on yonder green my lovely wife, and suffered to be seen yet extant on my shoulders such a greeting that whilst I live I shall think of that meeting. Ay, Rife, he beat him unmercifully, Rife. And now sparest him, Rife. I would that were hanged. No more, wife, no more. Where is the caitiff wretch hath done this deed? Lady, your pardon that I may proceed upon the quest of this injurious knight. And now, fair squire, repute me not the worse in leaving the great venture of the purse and the rich casket till some better leisure. Here comes the broker that purloined my treasure. Enter Jasper and Luce. Go, squire, and tell him I am here, an errant knight at arms, to crave delivery of that fair lady to her own knight's arms. If he deny, Bid him take choice of grand, and so defy him. From the knight that bears the golden pestle, I defy thee, knight, unless thou make fair restitution of that bright lady. Tell the knight that sent thee he is an ass, and I will keep the wench, and knock his headpiece. Knight, thou art but dead, if thou recall not thy uncourteous terms. Break his pate, Rafe! Break his pate, Rafe! Stonely! Come, knight, I am ready for you. Now your pestle shall try what temper, sir, your mortars of. Snatches away his pestle. With that, he stood upright in his stirrups, and gave the knight of the calfskin such a knock, that he forsook his horse, and down he fell. Knocks Rafe down. And then he leapt upon him, and plucking off his helmet. Nay, and my noble knight be down so soon, though I can scarcely go, I needs must run. Exit. Run, Rafe, run! Run for thy life, boy! Jasper comes, Jasper comes! Exit Rafe. Come, Luce, we must have other arms for you. Humphrey and Golden Pestle, both adieu. Exeunt. Sure the devil, God bless us, is in this springald. Why, George, didst ever see such a fire, Drake? I'm afraid my boy's miscarried. If he be, though he were Master Merrythought's son a thousand times, if there be any law in England, I'll make some of them smart for it. No, no, I have found out the matter, sweetheart. As sure as we are here, he is enchanted. He could no more have stood in Rafe's hands than I can in my Lord Mayor's. I'll have a ring to discover all enchantments, and Rafe shall beat him yet. Be no more vexed, for it shall be so. Scene 6 Before the Bell in Waltham Enter Rafe, Mistress Merrythought, Michael, Tim and George. Oh, husband, here's Rafe again! Stay, Rafe, again! Let me speak with thee! How dost thou, Rife? Art thou not shrewdly hurt? The foul great lunges laid unmercifully on thee. There's some sugar candy for thee. Proceed. Thou shalt have another bout with him. If Rafe had him at the fencing school, if he did not make a puppy of him and drive him up and down the school, he should never come in my shop more. Truly, Master Knight of the Burning Pestle, I am weary. Indeed, la, mother, and I am very hungry. Take comfort, gentle dame, and you, fair squire, for in this desert there must needs be placed many strong castles held by courteous knights. Until I bring you safe to one of those, I swear by this, my order, ne'er to leave you. Well said, Rafe. George, Rafe was ever comfortable, was he not? Yes, duck. I shall ne'er forget him. When he had lost our child, you know, it was strayed almost alone to Puddle Wharf, and the cries were abroad for it, and there it had drowned itself but for a scholar. Rafe was the most comfortablest to me. Peace, mistress, says he. Let it go. I'll get you another as good. Did he not, George? Did he not say so? Yes, indeed he did, Mouse. I would we had a mess of pottage and a pot of drink, squire, and were going to bed. Why, we are at Walthamstown's end, and that's the bell in. Take courage, valiant knight, damsel, and squire. I have discovered not a stone's cast off, an ancient castle held by the old knight of the most holy order of the bell, who gives to all knights errant entertain. There is plenty of food and all prepared. By the white hands of his own lady dear, he hath three squires that welcome all his guests. The first high chamberlino, who will see our beds prepared and bring us snowy sheets where never footman stretched his buttered hams. The second hight Tapstero, who will see our pots fulfilled, and no froth therein. 
a third a gentle squire ostlero height who will our palfrey slick with wisps of straw and in the manger put their oats enough and never grease their teeth with candle snuff that same dwarf's a pretty boy but the squire's a groutnel knock at the gates my squire with stately lance tim knocks on the door enter tapster who's there you're welcome gentlemen will you see a room right courteous and valiant knight of the burning pestle this is the squire tapstero fair squire tapstro i a wandering knight height of the burning pestle in the quest of this fair lady's casket and wrought purse losing myself in this vast wilderness and to this castle well by fortune brought where hearing of the goodly entertain your knight of holy order of the bell gives to all damsels and all errant knights i thought to knock and now am bold to enter and please you see a chamber you are very welcome Exeunt. i would have something done and i cannot tell what it is what is it nil why george shall ralph beat nobody again pretty sweetheart let him so he shall now and if i join with him we'll knock them all scene seven a room in the house of venture well enter humphrey and venture well oh george is master humphrey again now that lost mistress luce and mistress luce's father master humphrey will do someone's errand i warrant him father it's true in arms i ne'er shall clasp her for she is stolen away by your man jasper i thought he would tell him unhappy that i am to lose my child now i begin to think on jasper's words who oft hath urged me to thy foolishness why didst thou let her go thou lovest her not that wouldst bring home thy life and not bring her father forgive me shall i tell you true look on my shoulders they are black and blue whilst to and fro fair loose and i were winding he came and basted me with a hedge binding get men and horses straight we will be there within this hour you know the place again i know the place where he my loins did swaddle i'll get six horses and to each a saddle meantime i will go talk with jasper's father Exeunt severally george what wilt thou lay with me now that master humphrey is not mistress loose yet speak george what wilt thou lay with me no now i warrant thee jasper is at puckeridge with her by this nay george you must consider mistress loose's feet are tender and besides tis dark and i promise you truly i do not see how we should get out of walton forest with her yet nay coney what wilt thou lay with me that rafe has her not yet i will not lay against rafe honey because i have not spoken with him scene eight a room in mary thought's house enter mary thought but look george peace here comes the merry old gentleman again when it was grown to dark midnight and all were fast asleep in came margaret's grimly ghost and stood at william's feet i have money and meat and drink beforehand till to-morrow at noon why should i be sad methinks i have half a dozen jovial spirits within me i am three merry men and three merry men to what end should any man be sad in this world give me a man that when he goes to hanging cries trowl the black bowl to me and a woman that will sing a catch in her travail i have seen a man come by my door with a serious face in a black cloak without a hat-band carrying his head as if he looked for pins in the street i have looked out of my window half a year after and have spied that man's head upon london bridge tis vile never trust a tailor that does not sing at his work his mind is of nothing but filching mark this george tis worth noting godfrey my tailor you know never sings and he have fourteen yards to make this gown and i'll be sworn mistress pennystone the draper's wife had one made with twelve 
tis mirth that fills the veins with blood more than wine or sleep or food let each man keep his heart at ease no man dies of that disease he that would his body keep from diseases must not weep but whoever laughs and sings never he his body brings into fevers gouts or rooms or lingeringly his lungs consumes or meets with aches in the bone or cateras or griping stone but contented lives for i the more he lasts the more he might look george how sayest thou by this george it's not a fine old man now god's blessing on thy sweet lips when wilt thou be so merry george faith thou art the frowningest little thing when thou art angry in a country peace coney thou shalt see him taken down too i warrant thee and dare venture well here's lucy's father come now as you came from Walsingham, from that holy land, there met you not with my true love by the way as you came. Oh, Master Merrythought, my daughter's gone. This mirth becomes you not, my daughter's gone why and if she be what care i or let her come or go or tarry mock not my misery it is your son whom i have made my own when all forsook him has stolen my only joy my child away he sat her on a milk-white steed and himself upon a grey he never turned his face again but he bore her quite away unworthy of the kindness i have shown to thee and thine too late i well perceive thou art consenting to my daughter's loss your daughter what a stirs here with your daughter let her go think no more on her but sing loud if both my sons were on the gallows i would sing down 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 they fall down and arise they never shall oh might i behold her once again and she once more embrace her aged sire fie how scurvily this goes and she once more embrace her aged sire you'll make her a dog on her will ye she cares much for her aged sire i warrant you she cares not for her daddy nor she cares not for her mammy for she is she is she is she is my lord of low graves lassie for this thy scorn i will pursue that son of thine to death do and when you have killed him give him flowers in our palmer give him flowers in our give him red and white and blue green and yellow i'll fetch my daughter i'll hear no more your daughter it spoils my mirth i say i'll fetch my daughter was never man for lady's sake down, down, down. 
Tormented as I pull guy the dairy down. For Lucy's sake, that lady bright, down, down. As ever man beheld with eye, do dare down. I'll be revenged by heaven. Exaunt severally. How dost thou like this, George? Why, this is well, Coney. But if Rafe were hot once, thou should see more. Music. The fiddlers go again, husbands. Aye now, but this is scurvy music. I gave the wholesome gallows money, and I think he has not got me the weights of Southwark. If I hear them and not a non, I'll twinge him by the ears. You musicians, play Baloo! No, good George, let's have lacrime. Why, this is it, Coney. It's all the better, George. Now, sweet lamb, what story is that painted upon the cloth? The confutation of St Paul? No, lamb, that's Rafe and Lucrece. Rafe and Lucrece? Which Rafe? Our Rafe? No, Mouse. That was a Tartarian. A Tartarian? Well, I would the fiddlers have done that we might see our Rafe again. End of Act Two Act Three of The Night of the Burning Pestle by Francis Beaumont and John Fletcher. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Third. Scene One. Waltham Forest. Enter Jasper and Luce. Come, my dear, dear. Though we have lost our way, we have not lost ourselves. Are you not weary with this night's wandering, broken from your rest, and frightened with the terror that attends the darkness of this wild, unpeopled place? No, my best friend. I cannot either fear or entertain a weary thought, whilst you, the end of all my full desires, stand by me. Let them that lose their hopes and live to languish among the numbers of forsaken lovers tell the long weary steps and number time, start at a shadow and shrink up their blood, whilst I, possessed with awe, content and quiet, thus take my pretty love and thus embrace him. You have caught me, Luce. So fast that whilst I live, I shall become your faithful prisoner and wear these chains forever. Come sit down and rest your body too, too delicate for these disturbances. They sit down. So, will you sleep? Come, do not be more able than you are. I know you are not skilful in these watches, for women are no soldiers. Be not nice, but take it. Sleep, I say. I cannot sleep. Indeed I cannot, friend. Why then, we'll sing, and try how that will work upon our senses. I'll sing, or say, or anything but sleep. Come, little mermaid, rob me of my heart with that enchanting voice. <laughs> you mock me, Jasper. Tell me, dearest, what is love? Tis a lightning from above, tis an arrow, tis a fire, tis a boy they call desire, tis a smile doth beguile. The poor hearts of men that prove. Tell me more. Are women true? Some love change, and so do you. Are they fair and never kind? Yes, when men turn to the wind. Are they froward? Ever toward those that love to love anew. Dissemble it no more. I see the god of heavy sleep lay on his heavy mace upon your eyelids. I am very heavy. Sleeps. Sleep, sleep, and quiet breast crown thy sweet thoughts. Keep from her fair blood distempers, startings, horrors, and fearful shapes. Let all her dreams be joys and chaste delights, embraces, wishes, and such new pleasures as the ravished soul gives to the senses. So my charms have took. Keep her, you powers divine, whilst I contemplate upon the wealth and beauty of her mind. She is only fair and constant, only kind, and only to thee, Jasper. Oh, my joys, whither will you transport me? 
Let not fullness of my poor buried hopes come up together and overcharge my spirits. I am weak. Some say, however ill, the sea and women are governed by the moon. Both ebb and flow, both full of changes. Yet to them that know and truly judge, these but opinions are, and heresies to bring on a pleasing war between our tempers, that without these we're both void of afterlove and present fear, which are the best of Cupid. O oh, thou child, read from despair, I dare not entertain thee, having a love without the faults of women, and greater in her perfect goods than men, which to make good and please myself the stronger, though certainly I am certain of her love, I'll try her, that the world and memory may sing to aftertimes her constancy. Draws his sword. Loose, loose, awake! Why do you fright me, friend, with those distempered looks? What makes your sword drawn in your hand? Who hath offended you? I prithee, Jasper, sleep. Thou art wild with watching. Come, make your way to heaven, and bid the world, with all the villainies that stick upon it, farewell. You're for another life. Oh, Jasper, how have my tender years committed evil, especially against the man I love, thus to be cropped untimely? Foolish girl, couldst thou imagine I could love his daughter that flung me from my fortune into nothing, discharged me his service, shut the doors upon my poverty, and scorn my prayers, sending me, like a boat without a mast, to sink or swim? Come, by this hand you die. I must have life and blood to satisfy your father's wrongs. Away, George, away! Rise the watcher at Ludgate and bring a mittimus from the justice for this desperate villain. Now, I charge you, gentlemen, see the king's peace kept. Oh, my art, what a vile is this to offer men slaughter upon the armless gentlewoman. I warrant thee, sweetheart, we'll have him hampered. Oh, Jasper, be not cruel. If thou wilt kill me, smile and do it quickly. And let not many deaths appear before me. I am a woman made of fear and love, a weak, weak woman. Kill not with thy eyes, they shoot me through and through. Strike, I am ready, and dying will still love thee. Enter Venture Well, Humphrey, and attendants. Whereabouts? Aside. No more of this. Now, to myself again. There, there he stands with sword like martial knight drawn in his hand. Therefore beware the fight, you that be wise. For were I good Sir Beavis, I would not stay his coming by your leaves. Sarah, restore my daughter. Sarah, no. Upon him, then. They attack Jasper and force loose from him. So, down with him, down with him, down with him. Cut him in the leg, boys, cut him in the leg. Come your ways, minion. I'll provide a cage for you. You're grown so tame. Horse her away. Truly, I'm glad your forces have the day. Exhort all except Jasper. They are gone, and I am hurt. My love is lost, never to get again. Oh, me, unhappy. Bleed, bleed and die, I cannot. Oh, my folly, thou hast betrayed me. Hope, where art thou fled? Tell me if thou beest anywhere remaining, shall I but see my love again? Oh, no. She will not deign to look upon her butcher, nor is it fit she should. Then I must venture. Oh, chance, or fortune, or whatever thou art that men adore for powerful, hear my cry, and let me loving live. Or losing die. Exit. Is he gone, George? Aye, Coney. Marry him, let him go, sweetheart. By the faith of my body, he has put me into such a fright that I tremble, as they say, as twere an aspen leaf. Look at my little finger, George, how it shakes. Now, in truth, every member of my body is the worst for it. Come, hug in mine arms, sweet mouse. He shall not fright thee any more, unless mine own dear heart how it quivers. Scene two. A room in the Bell Inn, Waltham. Enter Mistress Merrythought, Rafe, Michael, Tim, George, Host, and Tapster. Oh, Rafe! How does thou, Rafe? How hast thou slept tonight? Has the night used thee well? Peace now, 
Let Rafe alone. Master, the reckoning is not paid. Right, courteous knight, who, for the order's sake which thou hast ta'en, angst out the holy bell, as I this flaming pestle bear about, we render thanks to your puissant self, your beauteous lady, and your gentle squires, for thus refreshing of our wearied limbs, stiffened with hard achievements in wild desert. Sir, there is twelve shillings to pay. Thou merry squire taps, dear o, thanks to thee for comforting our souls with double jug, and if adventurous fortune prick thee forth, thou jovial squire, to follow feats of arms, take heed, thou tender every lady's calls, every true knight, and every damsel fair, but spill the blood of treacherous Saracens and false enchanters, that with magic spells have done to death full many a noble knight. Thou valiant knight of the burning pestle, give ear to me. There's twelve shillings to pay, and, as I am a true knight, I will not bait a penny. George, I prithee, tell me, must Rafe pay twelve shillings now? No, no, no. Nothing but the old knight is merry with Rafe. Oh, it's nothing else. Rafe will be as merry as he. Sir Knight, this mirth of yours becomes you well. But to require this liberal courtesy, if any of your squires will follow arms, he shall receive from my heroic end a knighthood by the virtue of this pestle. Fair Knight, I thank you for your noble offer. Therefore, gentle Knight, twelve shillings you must pay, or I must cap you. Look, George, did not I tell thee as much? The Knight of the Bell is in earnest. Rafe should not be beholding to him. Give him his money, George, and let him go snick up. Cap Rafe? No. Hold your hand, sir, Knight of the Bell. There's your money. Gives money. Have you anything to say to Rafe now? Cap Rafe. I would you should know it. Rafe has friends that will not suffer him to be capped for ten times so much, and ten times to the end of that. Now, take thy course, Rafe. Come, Michael. Thou and I will go home to thy father. He has enough left to keep us a day or two, and we'll set fellows abroad to cry our purse and our casket. Shall we, Michael? Ay, I pray, mother. In truth, my feet are full of chilblains with travelling. Faith, and those chilblains are a foul trouble. Mistress Mary thought, when your youth comes home, let him rub all the soles of his feet and his heels and his ankles with a mouse skin. Or, if none of your people can catch a mouse, when he goes to bed, let him roll his feet in the warm embers, and I warrant you he shall be well. And you may make him put his fingers between his toes and smell to them. It's very sovereign for his head, if he be costive. Master Knight of the Burning Pestle, my son Michael and I bid you farewell. I thank your worship heartily for your kindness. Farewell, fair lady, and your tender squire. If pricking through these deserts I do hear of any traitorous knight who, through his guile, hath light upon your casket and your purse, I will despoil him of them and restore them. I thank your worship. Exit with Michael. Dwarf, bear my shield. Squire, elevate my lance. And now, farewell, you knight of the holy bell. Aye, aye, Rafe, all is paid. But yet, before I go, speak, worthy knight, if aught you do of sad adventures know, where errant knights may through his prowess win eternal fame, and free some gentle souls from endless bonds of steel and lingering pain. Sirrah, go to Nick the barber, and bid him prepare himself, as I told you before, quickly. I am gone, sir. Exit. Sir Knight... This wilderness afforded none but the great venture, where full many a knight hath tried his prowess, and come off with shame, and where I would not have you lose your life against no man but furious fiend of hell. Oh, speak on, sir knight. Tell what he is and where. For here I vow upon my blazing badge never to blaze a day in quietness, but bread and water will I only eat and the green herb and rock shall be my catch, till I have quelled that man, or beast, or fiend, that works such damage to all errant knights. Not far from hence, near to a craggy cliff, at the north end of this distressed town, 
there doth stand a lowly house, ruggedly builded, and in it a cave, in which an ugly giant now doth won. He clapped Barbarossa. In his hand he shakes a naked lance of purest steel, with sleeves turned up, and him before he wears a motley garment to preserve his clothes from blood of those knights which he massacres, and ladies gent. Without his door doth hang a copper basin on a prickened spear, at which no sooner gentle knights can knock, but the shrill sound fierce Barbarossa hears, and, rushing forth, brings in the errant knight, and sets him down in an enchanted chair. Then, with an engine which he hath prepared, with forty teeth, he claws his courtly crown. Next makes him wink, and underneath his chin he plants a brazen piece of mighty board, and knocks his bullets round about his cheeks. Whilst with his fingers, and an instrument with which he snaps his hair off, he doth fill the wretch's ears with a most hideous noise. Thus every night adventurer he doth trim, and now no creature dares encounters him. In God's name I will fight with him, kind sir. Go but before me to this dismal cave where this huge giant Barbarosso dwells, and by that virtue that brave Rossa clear, that damned brood of ugly giants slew, and Palmerin, friend Marco, overthrew. I doubt not but to curb this traitor foul, and to the devil send his guilty soul. Brave sprite at night, thus far I will perform this your request. I'll bring you within sight of this most loathsome place, inhabited by a more loathsome man. But dare not stay, for his main force swoops all he sees away. St. George, set on before, march, squire, and page. Exeunt. George, dost think Rafe will confound the giants? I hold my cap to a farthing he does. Why now? I saw him wrestle with the great Dutchman, and hurl him. Faith, and that Dutchman was a goodly man, if all things were answerable to his bigness. And yet, they say there was a Scotchman higher than he, and that they two and a knight met, and saw one another for nothing. But of all the sights that ever were in London since I were married, methinks the little child that was so fair grown about the members was the prettiest, that and the hermaphrodite. Nay, by your leave now, Nineveh was better. Nineveh! Oh, that was the story of Joan in the wall, was it not, George? Yes, lamb. Scene three. The street before Marythought's house. Enter Mrs. Marythought. Look, George, here comes Mistress Marythought again. And I would have Rafe come and fight with the giant. I tell you true, I long to see it. Good Mistress Merry Thoughts, be gone, I pray you, for my sake. I pray you forbear a little, and you shall have audience presently. I have a little business. Mistress Merry Thought, if it please you to refrain your passion a little, till Rafe has dispatched the giant out of the way, we shall think ourselves much bound to you. Exit, Mrs Merry Thought. I thank you, good Mistress Merry Thought. Boy, come hither. Enter boy. Send away Rafe and this wholesome giant quickly. In good faith, sir, we cannot. You'll utterly spoil our play and make it to be hissed. And it costs money. You will not suffer us to go on with our plot. I pray, gentlemen, rule him. Let him come now and dispatch this, and I'll trouble you no more. Will you give me your hand of that? Give him thy hand, George. Do, and I'll kiss him. I warrant thee, the youth means plainly. I will send him to you presently. Wife, kissing him. I thank you, little youth. Exit, boy. Faith, the child hath a sweet breath, George, but I think it be trouble with the worms. Cardus Benedictus and mare's milk were the only thing in the world for it. Scene four, before the barber shop, Waltham. Enter Rafe, host, Tim and George. Oh, Rafe's here, George. God send thee good luck, Rafe. Recent night, yonder his mansion is, lo, where the spare and copper basin are. Behold that string on which hangs many a tooth drawn from the gentle jaw of wandering knights. I dare not stay to sound. He will appear. Exit. Oh, faint not, heart. 
Susan, my lady dear, the cobbler's maid in Milk Street, for whose sake I take these arms, I'll let the thought of thee carry thy knight through all adventurous deeds, and in the honour of thy beauteous self, may I destroy this monster, Barbarosso. Knock, squire, upon the basin till it break, with the shrill strokes or till the giant spake. Tim knocks on the basin. Enter Barber. Oh, George, the giant, the giant! Now, Rafe, for thy life! What fond undoing wight is this? The dare so rudely knock at Barbarossa's cell, when no man comes but leaves his fleece behind. I, traitorous caitiff, who am sent by fate to punish all the sad enormities thou hast committed against ladies gentle and errant knights, traitor to God and men, prepare thyself. This is the dismal hour appointed for thee to give strict account of all thy beastly treacherous villainies. Full hardy knight, full soon thou shalt abide this fond reproach. Thy body will I bang. Takes down his pole. And lo, upon that string thy teeth shall hang. Prepare thyself, for dead soon shalt thou be. St. George for me. They fight. Gargantua for me. To him, Rafe, to him. Hold up the giant. Set out thy leg before Rafe. Falsify a blow, Rafe. Falsify a blow. The giant lies open on the left side. Bear off. Bear off still. There, boy. Oh, Rafe's almost down. Rafe's almost down. Susan, inspire me. Now, have up again. Up, 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 up. So, Rafe, down with him, down with him, Rafe. Fetch him over the hip, boy. Rafe knocks down the barber. There, boy. Kill, 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 Rafe. No, Rafe. Get all out of him first. Oh, presumptuous man. See to what desperate end thy treachery hath brought thee. The just gods who never prosper those that do despise them. For all the villainies which thou hast done to knights and ladies. Now have paid thee home. By my stiff arm, a knight adventurous. Oh, but say, vile wretch, before I send thy soul to sad Avernus, whither it must go, what captives holds thou in thy sable cave? Go in, and free them all, thou hast the day. Go, squire and dwarf, search in this dreadful cave, and free the wretched prisoners from their bonds. Exant Tim and George. I crave for mercy, as thou art a knight, and scorns to spill the blood of those that beg. Thou showest no mercy, nor shalt thou have any. Prepare thyself, for thou shalt surely die. Re-enter Tim, leading a man winking, with a basin under his chin. Behold, brave knight, here is one prisoner, whom this vile man hath used, as you see. This is the first wise word I heard the squire speak. Speak what thou art. And how thou hast been used, that I may give him condign punishment. I am a knight that took my journey post northward from London, and in courteous wise this giant trained me to his loathsome den, under pretense of killing of the itch, and all my body with a powder strewed that smarts and stings, and cut away my beard, and my curled locks wherein were ribbons tied and with the water washed my tender eyes, whilst up and down about me still he skipped, whose virtue is that, till my eyes be wiped with a dry cloth, for this my foul disgrace, I shall not dare to look a dog in the face. Alas, poor knight, relieve him, Rafe, relieve poor knights whilst you live. My trusty squire, convey him to the tan, where he may find relief. Adieu, fair knight. Exant man with Tim, who presently re-enters. Re-enter George, leading a second man, with a patch over his nose. Puissant knight of the burning pestle height, see here another wretch whom this foul beast hath scotched and scored in this inhuman wise. Speak me thy name, and eke thy place of birth, and what hath been thy usage in this cave. I am a knight, Sir Puckle is my name, and by my birth I am a Londoner, free by my copy, but my ancestors were Frenchmen all, 
and riding hard this way upon a trotting horse my bones did ache and i faint knight to ease my weary limbs light at this cave when straight this furious fiend with sharpest instrument and purest steel did cut the gristle of my nose away and in the place this velvet plaster stands relieve me gentle knight out of his hands good wife relieve sir pockhole and send him away for in truth his breath stinks convey him straight to the other knight sir pockhole fare you well kind sir good night exit with george who presently re-enters third man within cries within woman within deliver us hark george what a woeful cry there is i think some woman lies in there deliver us what ghastly noise is this speak barbarosso or by this blazing steel thy head goes off business of mine whom i in diet keep send lower down into the cave and in a tub that's heated smoking hot there may they find them and deliver them run squire and dwarf deliver them with speed exeunt tim and george but will not rafe kill this giant surely i am afraid if he let him go he will do as much hurt as he ever did not so mouse neither if he could convert him ay george if he could convert him but a giant is not so soon converted as one of us ordinary people there's a pretty tale of a witch that had the devil's mark about her could bless us that had a giant to her son that was called lob lie by the fire didst thou never hear it george peace now it comes to prisoners re-enter tim leading a third man with a glass of lotion in his hand and george leading a woman with a diet bread and drink in her hand. Here be these pined wretches, manful knight, that for this six weeks have not seen a wight. Deliver what you are, and how you came to this sad cave, and what your usage was. I am an errant knight that followed arms with spear and shield, and in my tender years I was stricken with Cupid's fiery shaft, and fell in love with this my lady dear and stole her from her friends in Turnbull Street, and bore her up and down from town to town, where we did eat and drink and music here, till at the length at this unhappy town we did arrive, and coming to this cave, this beast us caught, and put us in a tub, where we this two months sweat, and should have done another month, if you had not relieved us. This bread and water hath our diet been, together with the rib cut from a neck of burned mutton. Hard hath been our fare. Release us from this ugly giant's snare. This hath been all the food we have received, but only twice a day for novelty. He gave a spoonful of this hearty broth to each of us through this same slender quill. Pulls out his wrench. From this infernal monster you shall go, that use of knights and gentle ladies so convey them hence. Third man and woman are led off by Tim and George, who presently re enter. Coney, I can tell thee the gentlemen like Rafe. Ay, George, I see it well enough. Gentlemen, I thank you all heartily for gracing my man Rafe, and I promise you, you shall see him oftener. Mercy, great knight, I do recant my ill, and henceforth. Never gentle blood will spill. I give thee mercy, but yet shalt thou swear upon my burning pestle to perform thy promise uttered. I swear and kiss. Kisses the pestle. Depart then, and amend. Exit barber. Come, squire and dwarf, the sun grows towards his set, and we have many more adventures yet. Exeunt. Now Rafe is in this humour, I know he would have beaten all the boys in the house, if they had been set on him. Ay, George, but it is well as it is. I warrant you the gentlemen do consider what it is to overthrow a giant. Scene 5. The street before Marythought's house. Enter Mistress Marythought and Michael. But look, George, here comes Mistress Marythought and her son Michael. Now you are welcome, Mistress Marythought. Now Rafe has done, you may go on. 
Mick, my boy. I, forsooth, mother. Be merry, Mick. We are at home now, where, I warrant you, you shall find the house flung out of the windows. Music within. Hark. Hey, dogs, hey. This is the old world in faith with my husband. If I get in among them, I'll play them such a lesson that they shall have little list to come scraping hither again. Why, Master Merrythought. Husband, Charles Merrythought. Merrythought. Appearing above and singing. If you will sing and dance and laugh and ho 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 lo ho 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 and laugh again and then cry there boys there why there hen one two three and four we shall be merry within this hour. Why, Charles, do you not know your own natural wife? I say, open the door and turn me out those mangy companions. Tis more than time that they were fellow and fellow like with you. You are a gentleman, Charles, and an old man, and father of two children, and I myself, though I say it, by my mother's side, niece to a worshipful gentleman and a conductor. He has been three times in His Majesty's service at Chester, and is now the fourth time, God bless him and his charge, upon his journey. Go from my window, love, go. Go from my window, my dear. The wind and the rain will drive you back again. You cannot be lodged here. Hark you, Mistress Merrythought, you that walk upon adventures and forsake your husband, because he sings with never a penny in his purse? What, shall I think myself the worse? Faith, no, I'll be merry. You come not here. Here's none but lads of metal, lives of a hundred years and upwards. Care never drunk their bloods, nor want made them warble, Hi ho, my heart is heavy. Why, Master Merrythought, what am I that you should laugh me to scorn thus abruptly? Am I not your fellow feeler, as we may say, in all our miseries? Your comforter in health and sickness? Have I not brought you children? Are they not like you, Charles? Look upon thine own image, hard-hearted man. And yet for all this... Be gone, be gone, my joggy, my poggy. Be gone, my love, my dear. The weather is warm, twill do thee no harm. Thou canst not be lodged him. Be merry, boys, some light music and more wine. Exit above. He's not in earnest, I hope, George, is he? What if he be, sweetheart? Harry, if he be, George, I'll make bold to tell him he's an ingrant old man to use his bedfellow so scurvily. What? How does he use her, honey? Marry, come up, sir, saucebox. I think you'll take his part, will you not? Lord, how hot you have grown. You are a fine man, and you had a fine dog. It becomes you sweetly. Nay, prithee now, chide not. For, as I am an honest man, and a true Christian grocer, I do not like his doings. I cry you mercy then, George. You know we are all frail and full of infirmities. Do you hear, Master Merrythought? May I crave a word with you? Merrythought, appearing above. Strike up lively, lads. I had not thought, in truth, Master Merrythought, that a man of your age and discretion, as I may say, being a gentleman, and therefore known by your gentle conditions, could have used so little respect to the weakness of his wife, for your wife is your own flesh. The staff of your age, your young fellow, with whose help you draw through the maw of this transitory world. Nay, she's your own rib. And again, I came not hither for thee to teach. I have no pulpit for thee to preach. I would thou had kissed me under the breach, as thou art a lady gay. Marry with a vengeance. I am heartily sorry for the poor gentlewoman, but if I were thy wife, his faith grey be as his faith. I prithee, sweet honeysuckle, be content. Give me such word that am a gentlewoman born. Hang him, hoary rascal. 
Give me some drink, George. I am almost molten with fretting. Now beshrew his knave's heart for it. Exit citizen. Play me a light la volta. Come, be frolic. Fill the good fellow's wine. Why, Master Merrythought, are you disposed to make me wait here? You'll open, I hope. I'll fetch them that shall open else. Good woman, if you will sing, I'll give you something. If not... You are no love for me, Margaret. I am no love for you. Come aloft, boys, aloft. Exit above. Now a churl's fart in your teeth, sir. Come, Mick. We'll not trouble him. He shall not ding us in the teeth with his bread and his broth. That he shall not. Come, boy, I'll provide for thee, I warrant thee. We'll go to Master Venturewell's, the merchant. I'll get his letter to mine host of the bell in Waltham. There I'll place thee with the tapster. Will not that do well for thee, Mick? And let me alone for that old cuckoldy knave, your father. I'll use him in his kind eye, warrant ye. Exhort. Re-enter citizen with bear. Come, George, where's the beer? Here, love. This old fornicating fellow will not out of my mind yet. Gentlemen, I'll begin to you all, and I desire more of your acquaintance with all my art. Drinks. Fill the gentleman some beer, George. Enter boy. Look, George, the little boy's come again. Methinks he looks something like the Prince of Orange in his long stocking, if he had a little harness about his neck. George, I will have him dance fading. Fading is a fine jig, I'll assure you, gentlemen. Begin, brother. Boy dances. Now he capers, sweetheart. Now a turn of the toe, and then tumble. Cannot you tumble, youth? No, indeed, forsooth. Nor eat fire? Neither. Why then, I thank you heartily. There's a tuppence to buy your points withal. End of Act 3 Act 4 of The Knight of the Burning Pestle by Francis Beaumont and John Fletcher this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act 4. Scene 1. A street. Enter Jasper and Boy. There, Boy. Deliver this, but do it well. Hast thou provided me four lusty fellows able to carry me? Give us a letter. And art thou perfect in all thy business? Sir, you need not fear. I have my lesson here, and cannot miss it. The men are ready for you. And what else pertains to this appointment? There, my boy. Take it, but buy no land. Give us money. Faith, sir. It were rare to see so young a purchaser. I fly, and on my wings I carry your destiny. Go and be happy. Exit, boy. Now. My latest hope, forsake me not, but fling thy anchor out and let it hold. Stand fixed, thou rolling stone, till I enjoy my dearest. Hear me all, you powers that rule in men celestial. Exit. Go thy wise. Thou art as crooked as a sprig as ever grew in London. I'll warrant him he'll come to some naughty end or other, for his looks say no less. Besides, his father, you know, George, is none of the best. You heard him take me up like a flirt, Gil and sing bawdy songs upon me. But if faith, if I live, George... Let me alone, sweetheart. I have a trick in my head shall lodge him in the arches for a year, and make him sing Pescavi, ere I leave him. And yet he shall never know who hurt him, neither. Do, my good George, do. What shall we have Rafe do now, boy? You shall have what you will, sir. Why so, sir? Go and fetch him, then. And let the Sophie of Persia come and christen him of child. Believe me, sir... That will not do so well. Tis stale. It has been had before at the Red Bull. George, let Rife travel over great hills and let him be very weary and come to the king of Cracovia's house covered with black velvet. And there let the king's daughter stand in her window all in beaten gold, combing her golden locks with a comb of ivory. And let her spy Rife and fall in love with him and come down to him and carry him into her father's house. And then let Rife talk with her. Well said, Nell. It shall be so. Boy, let's have it done quickly. Sir, if you would imagine all this to be done already, you shall hear them talk together. 
but we cannot present a house covered in black velvet and a lady in beaten gold. Sir boy, let's have it as you can then. Besides, it will show ill fatedly to have a grocer's apprentice to court the king's daughter. Will it so, sir? You are well read in histories. I pray you, what was Sir Dagonet? Was he not prentice to a grocer in London? Read the play of The Four Prentices of London, where they tossed their pikes so. I pray you fetch him in, sir. Fetch him in. It shall be done. It's not our fault, gentlemen. Exit. Now we shall see fine doings, I warrant you, George. Scene two. A hall in the king of Moldavia's court. Enter Popiona, Rafe, Tim and George. Oh, here they come. How prettily the king of Krakowia's daughter is dressed. I know. It's the fashion of that country, I warrant ye. Welcome, sir knight, unto my father's court, king of Moldavia. Unto me, Pomponia, his daughter dear. But sure you do not like your entertainment, that will stay with us no longer but a night. Damsel, right fair. I am on many sad adventures bound, that call me forth into the wilderness. Besides, my horse's back is something gold, which will enforce me ride a sober pace. But many thanks, fair lady, be to you for using errant knight with courtesy. But say, brave knight, what is your name and birth? My name is Rafe. I am an Englishman as true as steel, a hearty Englishman, and prentice to a grocer in a strand, by deed intent of which I have one part. But fortune calling me to follow arms, on me this holy order I did take, of burning pestle, which in all men's eyes I bear, confounding ladies' enemies. Oft have I heard of your brave countrymen, and fertile soil and store of wholesome food. My father oft will tell me of a drink in England found, a nipitato called, which driveth all sorrow from your hearts. Lady, tis true. You need not lay your lips to better nipitato than there is. And of a wild fowl he will often speak, which powdered beef and mustard called is. For there have been great wars twixt us and you. But truly, Rafe, it was not long of me. Tell me then, Rafe, could you contented be to wear a lady's favour in your shield? I am a knight of religious order, and will not wear a favour of a lady's that trusts in antichrist and false traditions. Well said, Rafe. Convert her if thou canst. Besides, I have a lady of my own in merry England, for whose virtuous sake I took these arms, and Susan is her name, a cobbler's maid in Milk Street whom I vow ne'er to forsake, whilst life and pestle last. Happy that cobbling dame, whoe'er she be, that for her own dear Rafe hath gotten thee. Unhappy I, that ne'er shall see the day to see thee more, that bearest my heart away. Lady, farewell. I must needs take my leave. Hard-hearted Rafe, that ladies dost deceive. Hark thee, Rafe. There's money for thee. Give us money. Give something in the king of Krakowia's house. Be not beholding to him. Uh, lady, before I go, I must remember your father's officers, who, truth to tell, have been about me very diligent. Hold up thy snowy hand, thou princely maid. There's twelve pence for your father's chamberlain, and another shilling for his cook. For, by my troth, the goose was roasted well. And twelve pence for your father's horse-keeper, for knighting my horse back. And for his butter there is another shilling. To the maid that washed my boot hoes, there's an English groat. And tuppence to the boy that wiped my boots. And last, fair lady, there is for yourself three pence to buy you pins at Bumbo Fair. Full many thanks, and I will keep them safe till all the heads be off. For thy sake, Rafe. Advance, my squire and dwarf, I cannot stay. Thou killst my heart in passing thus away. Exeunt. I commend Rafe yet, that he will not stoop to a Cacovian. There's properer women in London than any are here, I was. Scene three. A room in the house of Aventure Well. Enter Aventure Well, Humphrey, Luce, and Boy. But here comes Master Humphrey, and his love again now, George. Aye, Coney, peace. 
Oh, get you up. I will not be entreated. And, gossip mine, I'll keep you sure hereafter from getting out again with boys and unthrifts. Come, they are women's tears. I know your fashion. Go, Sarah, lock her in, and keep the key safe as you love your life. Exant, loose and boy. Now, my son Humphrey, you may both rest assured of my love in this and reap your own desire. I see this love you speak of through your daughter, although the whole be little, and hereafter will yield the like in all I may or can, fitting a Christian and a gentleman. I do believe you, my good son, and thank you, for twere an impudence to think you flattered. It were indeed, but shall I tell you why? I have been beaten twice about the lie. Well, son, no more of compliment. My daughter is yours again. Appoint the time and take her. We'll have no stealing for it. I myself and some few of our friends will see you married. I would you would, if faith, for be it known I ever was afraid to lie alone. Some three days hence, then. Three days. Let me see. Tis somewhat of the most. Yet I agree, because I mean against the appointed day to visit all my friends in new array. Enter servant. Sir, there's a gentlewoman without would speak with your worship. What is she? Sir, I asked her not. Bid her come in. Exit servant. Enter Mistress Merrythought and Michael. Peace be to your worship. I come as a poor suitor to you, sir, in the behalf of this child. Are you not wife to Merry Thought? Yes, truly. Would I have never seen his eyes. He has undone me and himself and his children. And there he lives at home and sings and hoits and revels among his drunken companions. But I warrant you, where to get a penny to put bread in his mouth he knows not. And therefore, if it like your worship, I would entreat your letter to the honest host of the bell in Waltham that I may place my child under the protection of his tapster in some settled course of life. I'm glad the heavens have heard my prayers. Thy husband, when I was ripe in sorrows, laughed at me. Thy son, like an unthankful wretch, I, having redeemed him from his fall and made him mine, to show his love again, first stole my daughter, then wronged this gentleman, and last of all, gave me that grief had almost brought me down unto my grave, had not a stronger hand relieved my sorrows. Go and weep as I did, and be unpitied, for I here profess an everlasting hate to all thy name. Will you so, sir? How say you by that? Come, Mick, let him keep his wind to cool his pottage. We'll go to thy nurses, Mick. She knits silk stockings, boy, and we'll knit too, boy, and be beholding to none of them at all. Exit with Michael. Enter boy. Sir, I take it you're the master of this house. How then, boy? Then to yourself, sir, comes this letter. Gives letter. From whom, my pretty boy? From him that was your servant. But no more shall that name ever be, for he is dead. Grief of your purchased anger broke his heart. I saw him die, and from his hand received this paper, with a torch to bring it hither. Read it, and satisfy yourself in all. Venture well. Reads. Sir, that I have wronged your love I must confess, in which I have purchased to myself besides mine own undoing the ill opinion of my friends <laughs> let not your anger good sir outlive me but suffer me to rest in peace with your forgiveness let my body if a dying man may so much prevail with you be brought to your daughter that she may truly know my hot flames are now buried and withal receive a testimony of the zeal i bore her virtue farewell forever and be ever happy jasper god's hand is great in this i do forgive him 
yet i am glad he's quiet where i hope he will not bite again boy bring the body and let him have his will if that be all it is here without sir so sir if you please you may conduct it in i do not fear it i'll be your usher boy for though i say it he owed me something once and well did pay it exeunt scene four another room in the house of venturewell enter loose if there be any punishment inflicted upon the miserable more than yet i feel let it together seize me and at once press down my soul i cannot bear the pain in these delaying tortures thou art the end of all and the sweet rest of all come come o death bring me to thy peace and blot out all memory i nourish both my father and my cruel friend o wretched maid still living to be wretched to be say to fortune in her changes and grow to number times and woes together how happy i had been if being born my grave had been my cradle enter servant by your leave young mistress here's a boy hath brought a coffin what he would say i know not but your father charged me to give you notice here they come exit enter boy and two men bearing a coffin for me i hope tis come and tis most welcome fair mistress let me not add greater grief to that great store you have already jasper that whilst he lived was yours now dead and here in clothes commanded me to bring his body hither and to crave a tear from those fair eyes then he deserved not pity to deck his funeral for so he bid me tell her for whom he died he shall have many good friends depart a little whilst i take my leave of this dead man that once i loved exaunt boy and men hold yet a little life and then i give thee to the first heavenly beings o oh, my friend hast thou deceived me thus and got before me i shall not long be after but believe me thou wert too cruel jasp against thyself in punishing the fault i could have pardoned with so untimely death thou didst not wrong me if ever wert most kind most true most loving and i the most unkind most false most cruel didst thou but ask a tear i'll give thee all even all my eyes can pour down all my sighs and all myself before thou goest from me these are but sparing rites if thy soul be yet about this place and can behold and see what i prepare to deck thee with it shall go up born on wings of peace and satisfied first i will sing thy dirge then kiss thy pale lips then die myself and fill one coffin and one grave together from those whose loves are dead and whilst i sing weep and ring every hand and every head bind with cypress and sad yew ribbons black and candles blue for him that was of most men true come with heavy moaning and on his grave let him have sacrifice of sighs and groaning let him have fair flowers in no white and purple green and yellow for him that was of men most true thou sable cloth sad covers of my joy i lift thee up thus i meet with death removes the cloth and jasper rises out of the coffin and thus you meet the living save me heaven nay do not fly me fair i am no spirit look better on me do you know me yet Oh, thou dear shadow of a friend. Dear substance, I swear I am no shadow. Feel my hand, it is the same it was. I am your Jasper, your Jasper that's yet living and yet loving. Pardon my rash attempt, my foolish proof I put in practice of your constancy. For sooner should my sword have drunk my blood and set my soul at liberty than draw in the least drop from that body for which boldness doomed me to anything. If death... 
I take it, and willingly. This death, I'll give you for it. Kisses him. So now I am satisfied you are no spirit, but my own truest, truest, truest friend. Why do you come thus to me? First to see you, then to convey you hence. It cannot be, for I am locked here and watched at all hours. That tis impossible for me to escape. Nothing more possible. Within this coffin do you convey yourself. Let me alone, I have the wits of twenty men about me. Only I crave the shelter of your closet a little, and then fear me not. Creep in, that they may presently convey you hence. Fear nothing, dearest love. I'll be your second. Luce lies down in the coffin, and Jasper covers her with the cloth. Lie close. So, all goes well yet. Boy! Re-enter boy and men. At hand, sir. Convey away the coffin and be wary. It's done already. Exant men with the coffin. Now must I go conjure. Exit into a closet. Enter venture well. Oi! Oi! Your servant, sir. Do me this kindness, boy. Hold, here's a crown. Before thou bury the body of this fellow, carry it to his old merry father, and salute him from me, and bid him sing. He hath cause. I will, sir. And then bring me word what tune he is in, and have another crown. But do it truly. I have fitted him a bargain now will vex him. God bless your worship's health, sir. Farewell, boy. Exant severally. Scene five. A street before Merrythought's house. Enter Merrythought. Ah, old Merrythought, art thou there again? Let's hear some of thy songs. Who can sing a merrier note than he that cannot change a groat? Not a denier left, and yet my heart leaps. I do wonder yet, as old as I am, that any man will follow a trade or serve, that may sing and laugh and walk the streets. My wife and both my sons are, I know not where. I have nothing left, nor know I how to come by meat to supper. Yet I am merry still, for I know I shall find it upon the table at six o'clock. Therefore, hang thought! I would not be a serving man to carry the cloak bag still, nor would I be a falconer the greedy ox to fill, but I would begin a good house and have a good master too. But I would eat and drink of the best, and no work would I do. This it is that keeps life and soul together, mirth. This is the philosopher's stone that they write so much on, that keeps a man ever young. Enter boy. Sir, they say they know all your money is gone, and they'll trust you for no more drink. Will they not? Let them choose. The best is, I have mirth at home, and need not send abroad for that. Let them keep their drink to themselves. For Julian of Berry, she dwells on a hill, and she hath good beer and a hail to sell, and of good fellow she thinks no ill, and thither will we he go now, 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 and thither will we he go now. And when you have made a little stay, you need not ask what he is to pay, but kiss your hostess and go your way, and thither will we go now, 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 and thither will we go now. 
Enter another boy. Sir, I can get no bread for supper. Hang bread and supper. Let's preserve our mirth, and we shall never feel hunger, I'll warrant you. Let's have a catch, boys. Follow me. Come. Ho, ho, ho nobody, nobody at ho. home. Meat Me, nor drink, drink, nor no money have we none. Fill the, the pot, ye die. Never more need I. I. So, boys, enough. Follow me. Let's change our place, and we shall laugh afresh. Exeunt. Let him go, George. He shall not have any countenance from us, nor a good word from any of the company, if I may strike stroking. No more he shall not love. But now, I will have Rafe do a notable matter now, to the eternal honour and glory of all grocers. Sirrah, you there, boy. Can none of you hear? Enter, boy. Sir, your pleasure. Let Rafe come out on May Day in the morning and speak upon conduits, with all his scarfs about him, and his feathers, and his rings, and his necks. Why, sir, you did not think of our plot. What will become of that, then? Why, sir, I care not what becomes on it. I'll have him come out, or I'll fetch him out myself. I'll have something done in honour of the city. Besides, he hath been long enough upon adventures. Bring him out quickly. Or if I come in amongst you... Well, sir, he should come out. But if I play Miss Carey, sir, you are like to pay for it. Bring him away, then. Exit, boy. This will be brave, if faith. George, shall he not dance the Morris too, for the credit of the Strand? No, sweetheart. It'll be too much for the boy. Oh, there he is, Neil. He's reasonable well in repairal, but he has not rings enough. Landon, to thee I do present the merry month of May. Let each true subject be content to hear me what I say. For from the top of conduit head, as plainly may appear, I will both tell my name to you, and wherefore I came here. My name is Rafe, by due descent, though not ignoble I, yet far inferior to the flock of gracious grocer I and by the common counsel of my fellows in the strand, with gilded staff and crossed scarf, the maylord here I stand. Rejoice, O English arts, rejoice, rejoice, O lovers dear, rejoice, O city, town and country, rejoice eke every shire, for now the fragrant flowers do spring and sprout in seemly sort, the little birds do sit and sing, the lambs do make fine sport, and now the birchin tree doth bud that makes the schoolboys cry. The morris rings while hobby horse doth foot it featious lie. The lords and ladies now abroad for their disport and play do kiss, and sometimes upon the grass, and sometimes in the hay. Now butter with a leaf of sage is good to purge the blood. Fly Venus and phlebotomy, for they are neither good. Now little fish on tender stone begin to cast their bellies, and sluggish snails that erst were mute do creep out of their shellies. The rambling rivers now do warm for little boys to paddle. The sturdy steed now goes to grass, and up they hang his saddle. The heavy heart, the blowing buck, the rascal and the pricket are now among the yeoman's peas and leave the fearful thicket. And be like them, O oh you, I say, of this same noble town, and lift aloft your velvet heads and slip in of your gown, with bells on legs and napkins clean and to your shoulders tied, with scarfs and garters as you please, and hey, for our town cried. March out, and show your willing minds by twenty and by twenty, to Ogston or to Newington, where ale and cakes are plenty. And let it ne'er be said for shame, that we, the youths of London, lay thrumming of our caps at home, and left our custom undone. Up, then I say, both young and old, both man and maid a maying, with drums and guns that bands a lad, and merry tabor playing which to prolong, God save our king, and send his country peace, and root out treason from the land. And so, my friends, I cease. Exit. End of Act 4
Act Five of The Night of the Burning Pestle by Francis Beaumont and John Fletcher. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Fifth, Scene One, A Room in the House of a Venture Well. Enter Venture Well. I will have no great store of company at the wedding a couple of neighbours and their wives and we will have a capon in stewed broth with marrow and a good piece of beef stuck with rosemary enter jasper with his face mealed bear thy pains fond man it is too late heaven bless me jasper i i am his ghost whom thou hast injured for his constant love. Fond, worldly wretch, who dost not understand in death that true hearts cannot be parted be. First, though thy daughter is quite borne away on wings of angels through the liquid air, too far out of thy reach, and never more shalt thou behold her face. But she and I will in another world enjoy our loves, where neither father's anger, poverty, nor any cross that troubles earthly men shall make us sever our united hearts. And never shalt thou sit or be alone in any place, but I will visit thee with ghastly looks and put into thy mind the great offences which thou didst to me. And thou at thy table with thy friends, merry in heart and filled with swelling wine, I'll come in midst of all thy pride and mirth, invisible to all men but thyself, and whisper such a sad tale in thine ear, shall make thee let the cup fall from thy hand, and stand as mute and pale as death itself. Oh, forgive me, Jasper. Oh, what might I do? Tell me, to satisfy thy troubled ghost. There is no means. Too late thou thinkest of this. But tell me what were best for me to do. Repent thy deed, and satisfy my father, and beat Fawn Humphrey out of thy doors. Exit. Look, George, his very ghost would have folks beaten. Enter Humphrey. Father, my bride is gone, fair mistress Luce. My soul's the fount of vengeance, mischief slew us. Hence, fool, out of my sight with thy fond passion. Thou hast undone me. Beat him. Hold, my father dear, for loose thy daughter's sake that had no peer. Thy father, fool, there's some blows more. Be gone. Beat him. Jasper, I hope thy ghost be well appeased to see thy will performed. Now will I go to satisfy thy father for thy wrongs. Aside and exit. What shall I do? I have been beaten twice, and Mistress Luce is gone. Help me, device, since my true love is gone. I never more, whilst I do live upon the sky, will pour, but in the dark will wear out my shoe soles in passion in St. Faith's church under Paul's. Exit. George, call Rife hither. If you love me, call Rife hither. I have the bravest thing for him to do, George. Prithee, call him quickly. Rafe! Why, Rafe, boy! Enter Rafe. Come hither, Rafe. Come to thy mistress, boy. Rafe, I would have thee call all the youth together in battle ray with drums and guns and flags and march to Mile End in pompous fashion and there exhort your soldiers to be merry and wise and to keep their beards from burning, Rafe, and then skirmish and let your flags fly and cry, Kill! 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 My husband shall lend you his jerkin, Rafe. And there's a scarf, and for the rest, the house shall furnish you, and we'll pay for it. Do it bravely, Rafe, and think before whom you perform, and what person you represent. I warrant you, mistress, if I do it not, for the honour of the city and the credit of my master, let me never hope for freedom. Tis well spoken, if faith. Go thy wise, thou art a spark indeed. Rafe, Rafe, double your fires bravely, Rafe. <laughs> I warrant you, sir. Exit. Let him look narrowly to his service. I shall take him else. I was there myself, a pikeman once, in the hottest of the day, wench. Had my feather shot sheer away, 
the fringe of my pipe burnt off with powder, my pate broken with a scouring stick, and yet, I thank God, I am here. Drums within. Hark, George, the drums! Ran ten, 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 ten. O oh, wench, and thou hadst but seen little Ned of Olgate, drum Ned. How he made it roar again, and laid on like a tyrant, and struck softly till the war came up, and then thundered again, and together we go. Sa, 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 bounce, quote the guns. Courage, my hearts, quote the captain. St. George, quote the pipeman. And withal, here they lay, and there they lay. And yet for all this, I am here, wench. Be thankful for it, George, for indeed tis wonderful. Scene two. A street, and afterwards Mile End. Enter Rafe and company of soldiers, among whom are William Hamerton and George Greengoose, with drums and collars. March fair, my hearts. Lieutenant, beat the rear up. Ancient, let your colours fly, but have a great care of the butcher's hooks at Whitechapel. They have been the death of many a fair ancient. Open your files, that I may take a view of both of your persons and munition. Sergeant, call a muster. A stand, William Hamerton, Putra. Here, Captain. A corslet and a Spanish pipe. Tis well. Can you shake it with a terror? I hope so, Captain. Charge upon me. He charges on Rafe. Oh, tis with the weakest. But more strength, William Hamerton, more strength. As you were again. Proceed, Sergeant. George Greengoose, Poultra. Here. Let me see your peas, neighbour Greengoose. When was she shot in? Ant like you, Master Captain. I made a shot even now, partly to scour her, and partly for audacity. It should seem so, certainly, for her breath is yet inflamed. Besides, there is a main fault in a touch hole. It runs and stinketh, and I tell you moreover, and believe it, ten such touch holes would breed the pox in the army. Get you a feather, neighbour, get you a feather, sweet oil and paper, and your peace may do well enough yet. Where's your powder? Here. What, in a paper? As I am a soldier and a gentleman, it craves a martial court. You ought to die for it. Where's your horn? Answer me to that. Ant like you, sir. I was oblivious. Oh, it likes me not it should be so. Tis a shame for you and a scandal to all our neighbours, being a man of worth and estimation, to leave your horn behind you. I am afraid twill breed example. But let me tell you no more, aunt. Stand till I view you all. What's become of the nose of your flask? Indeed. La, Captain. Twas blown away with powder. Put on a new one at the city's charge. Where's the stone of this piece? The drummer took it out to light tobacco. Oh, tis a fault, my friend. Put it in again. You want a nose, and you a stone. Sergeant, take a note on it, for I mean to stop it in the pay. Remove and march. They march. Soft and fair, gentlemen, soft and fair. Double and files as you were, faces about. Now, you, with the sodden face, keep in there. Look to your match, sirrah. It will be in your fellow's flask anon. So, make a crescent now. Advance your pikes, stand and give ear. Gentlemen, countrymen, friends, and my fellow soldiers, I have brought you this day from the shops of security and the counters of content to measure out in these furious fields honour by the L and prowess by the pound. Let it not, oh, let it not, I say, be told hereafter, the noble issue of this city fainted, but bear yourselves in this fair action like men, valiant men, and free men. Fear not the face of the enemy, nor the noise of the guns, for believe me, brethren, the rude rumbling of a brewer's car is far more terrible of which you have a daily experience. Neither let the stink of powder offend you, since a more valiant stink is nightly with you. To a resolve, mind, his home is everywhere. 
I speak not this to take away the hope of your return, for you shall see, I do not doubt it, and that very shortly your loving wives again, and your sweet children, whose care doth bear you company in baskets. Remember then whose cause you have in hand, and, like a sort of true-born scavengers, scow me this famous realm of enemies. I have no more to say but this. Stand to your tacklings, lads, and show to the world you can as well brandish a sword as shake an apron. St. George, and on my arts. St. George. St. George. Saint George. Saint George. Excellent. "'Twas well done, Rafe. I'll send thee a cold cape on a field and a bottle of March beer, and, it may be, come myself to see thee. Now, the boy hath deceived me much. I did not think it had been in him. He has performed such a matter, wench, that, if I live, next year I'll have him captain of the galley foist, or I'll want my will. Scene 3. A room in Merrythought's house. Enter Merrythought. Yet, I thank God. I break not a wrinkle more than I had. Not a stoop, boys? Care. Live with cats, I defy thee. My heart is as sound as an oak, and though I want drink to wet my whistle, I can sing. Come no more there, boys, come no more there, for we shall never whilst we live come any more there. Enter boy and two men bearing a coffin. God save you, sir. It's a brave boy. Canst thou sing? Yes, sir, I can sing. But it's not so necessary at this time. Sing we enchant it while love doth grant it. Sir, sir, if you knew what I have brought you, you would have little list to sing. Oh, the mimic round full long I have thee sought, and now I have thee found, and what hast thou here brought? A coffin, sir, and your dead son Jasper in it. Exit with men. Dead? Why, farewell, he thou wast a bonny boy, and I did love thee. Enter Jasper. Then I pray you, sir, do so still. Jasper's ghost. Thou art welcome from Stygian Lake, so soon declare to me what wondrous things in Pluto's court are done. By my troth, sir, I never came there. Tis too hot for me, sir. A merry ghost. A very merry ghost. And where is your true love? Oh, where is your horse? Mary, look you, sir. Removes the cloth, and Luce rises out of the coffin. Aha! Art thou good at that, in faith? With hatred, see tolery whiskin. The world it runs on wheels. When the young man's <coughs> ah, ah, up goes the maiden's heels. Mistress Mary thought and Michael within. What, Master Mary thought? Will you not let us in? What do you think shall become of us? What voice is that that calleth at our door? You know me well enough. I am sure I have not been such a stranger to you. And some they whistled, and some they sung, hey, 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 down, down. And some did loudly say, ever as the Lord Barnett's horn blew, away, Musgrave, away. You will not have us starve here, will you, Master Mary thought? Nay, good sir, be persuaded. She is my mother. If her offences have been great against you, let your own love remember she is yours, and so forgive her. Good Master Mary Thought, let me entreat you. I will not be denied. Why, Master Mary Thought, will you be a vexed thing still? Woman, I take you to my love again, but you shall sing before you enter. Therefore dispatch your song, and so come in. 
Well, you must have your will when all is done. Mick, what song canst thou sing, boy? Michael, within. I can sing none, forsooth, but a lady's daughter with Paris properly. It was a lady's daughter, etc. Marythought opens the door. Enter Mistress, Marythought and Michael. Come, you're welcome home again. If such danger be in playing, and just must to her nest turn, you shall go no more to maying. Venture well, within. Are you within, sir? Master Merry thought? It is my master's voice. Good sir, go hold him in talk whilst we convey ourselves into some inward room. Exit with the loose. What are you? Are you merry? You must be very merry if you enter. I am, sir. Sing, then. Nay, good sir, open to me. Sing, I say. Or, by the merry heart, you come not in. Well, sir, I'll sing. Uh, fortune, my fault, etc. Mary thought opens the door. Enter venture well. You are welcome, sir. You are welcome. You see your entertainment. Pray you be merry. Oh, Master Mary thought, I'm come to ask your forgiveness for the wrongs I offered you and your most virtuous son. They are infinite. Yet my contrition shall be more than they. I do confess my hardness broke his heart, for which just heaven hath given me punishment more than my age can carry. His wandering spirit, nor yet at rest, pursues me everywhere, crying, I'll haunt thee for thy cruelty. My daughter, she is gone. I know not how. Taken invisible. And whether living or in the grave, tis yet uncertain to me. Oh, Master Merrythought, these other weights will sink me to my grave. Forgive me, sir. Why, sir, I do forgive you, and be merry. And if the wag in his lifetime played the knave, can you forgive him, too? With all my heart, sir. Speak it again, and heartily. I do, sir. Now, by my soul, I do. Re-enter Luce and Jasper. With that came out his paramour. She was as white as the lily flower, a tall trolly lolling. With that came out her own dear knight. He was as true as ere did fight, etc. Sir, if you will forgive him, Clap their hands together. There's no more to be said in the matter. I do. I do. I do not like this. Peace, boys. Hear me, one of you. Everybody's part has come to an end but Rafe's, and he's left out. Tis long of yourself, sir. We have nothing to do with his part. Rafe, come away. Make an end on him, as you've done with the rest, boys. Come. Now, good husbands, let him come out and die. He shall now. Rafe, come away quickly, and die, boy. It will be very unfit he should die, sir, upon no occasion, and in a comedy, too. Take you no care of that, sir, boy. Is not his part at an end, think you, when he's dead? Come away, Rafe. Enter Rafe with a forked arrow through his head. When I was mortal, this my costive core did lap up figs and raisins in a strand. Where sitting, I espied a lovely dame, whose master wrought with lingle and with all, and underground he vampied many a boot. Straight did her love prick forth me, tender sprig, to follow feats of arms in warlike wise, 
through Waltham Desert, where I did perform many achievements, and did lay on ground huge Barbarosso, that insulting giant, and all his captives soon set at liberty. Then, honour pricked me from my native soil into Moldavia, where I gained the love of Pompeiana, his beloved daughter, but yet proved constant to the black-thumbed maid Susan, and scored Pompeiana's love. Yet liberal I was, and gave her pins and money for her father's officers. I then returned home, and thrust myself in action, and by all men chosen was Lord of the May, where I did flourish it, with scarves and rings, and posy in my hand. After this action, I preferred was, and chosen city captain at Mile End, with hat and feather, and with leading staff, and trained my men, and brought them all off clear, save one man that berated him with the noise. But all these things I, Rafe, did undertake, only for the beloved Susan's sake. Then coming home, and sitting in my shop with apron blue, death came unto my stall to cheap an aqua vitae. But ere I could take the bottle down, and fill a taste, death caught a pound of pepper in his hand, and sprinkled all my face and body o'er, and in an instant vanished away. Tis a pretty fiction, I faith. Then took I up my bow and shaft in end, and walked into more fields to cool myself. But there grim, cruel death met me again, and shot this fucked arrow through my head, and now I faint. Therefore be warned by me, my fellows, every one, of fucked heads. Farewell, all you good boys in merry London. Ne'er shall we more upon Shrove Tuesday meet and pluck down houses of iniquity. Oh, my pain increaseth. I shall never more hold open whilst another pumps both legs, nor daub a satin gown with rotten eggs. Set up a stake. Oh, ne'er more I shall. I die. Fly. Fly my soul to grosses all. Oh, 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 oh. Well said, Rafe. Do your obeisance to the gentleman and go your ways. Well said, Rafe. Rafe rises, make obeisance and exit. Me thinks all we, thus kindly and unexpectedly reconciled, should not depart without a song. A good motion. Strike up, then. Better music ne'er was known Than a choir of hearts in one Let each other that hath been Troubled with the gall or spleen Learn of us to keep his brow Smooth and plain as ours are now, Sing though before the hour of dying, He shall rise and then be crying. Hey, hey ho, tis naught but mirth That keeps the body from the earth. Exeunt. Come now, shall we go? The play's done. Nay, by my faith, George, I have more manners than so. I'll speak to these gentlemen first. I thank you all, gentlemen, for your patience and countenance to Rafe, a poor fatherless child. And if I might see you at my house, it should go hard, but I will have a bottle of wine and a pipe of tobacco for you. For truly, I hope you do like the youth. But I will be glad to know the truth. I refer it to your own discretions, whether you will applaud him or no. For I will wink. And whilst you shall do what you will, I thank you with all my heart. God give you good night. Come, George. Exeunt. End of Act Five. End of The Night of the Burning Pestle by Francis Beaumont and John Fletcher.